this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast, season three. My name is Yvonne Hartley from the Jeremy Bamber Innocence Campaign. This month, unfortunately this month, there have been no updates regarding the submissions which were made two years ago now to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. Although we do know that they are actively reviewing the information that they were sent on Jeremy's new submissions. We hope to be able to bring you positive news on this front in the coming weeks. Turning to campaign news, we had a very successful annual general meeting a few weeks ago. In this meeting, we discussed the plans, what we have for the coming year, to raise even more awareness about Jeremy's case and to establish if there is anything proactive which we can do at this stage. Although some of these plans for events will be put on hold until we see what the outcome is from the Criminal Cases Review Commission and how long that's going to take. In other news, four weeks ago, the campaign came into possession of a vast amount of material, which we had previously thought was destroyed. We are systematically going through this material to find anything that might support our submissions. So far, many interesting items have come to light and there will be a podcast about this next month. In other news, we recently discovered that former Detective Superintendent Michael Ainsley, who is at the heart of Jeremy's wrongful conviction, died. This means that he will no longer be able to face the justice for the acts of corruption and fabrication that he committed in Jeremy's case. We will be producing a podcast highlighting all of these features within the next few months. Turning to today's podcast, this is a discussion between myself and Emma Morris, who has been corresponding with another wrongful conviction case of a man called David Kent. You may not have heard of David, But I'm sure that after you've listened to this podcast, you will have empathy with him and the situation that he is facing, fighting for his justice and freedom. Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm Season 3 podcast. My name is Yvonne Hartley from the campaign team and I'm joined by my colleague, Emma Morris. Hi, Emma. Hi, Yvonne. It's lovely for you to join us today. So today, Emma's going to talk about another potential miscarriage of justice case, and it's that of David J. Kent, who was convicted for the attempted murder of an ex-girlfriend, and the incident occurred on the 21st of November 2008. So I'm going to hand you over to Emma, who's going to tell us all about this sad story. Uh, Thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, so you won't have heard of David J. Kent. I don't think many people have heard of of who he is. He doesn't have a campaign team. He doesn't have family that's able to help him and raise awareness for his case. He's like many other prisoners maintaining their innocence, um, essentially forgotten and and unheard. So that's why we wanted to tell David's story today from David himself. wanted to give him a voice, ultimately. So, like you say, Yvonne, he was convicted of attempted murder of an ex-girlfriend. Uh, the incident occurred on the 21st of November 2008, Derbyshire Village. He was sentenced to a discretionary life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 11 years. He's served nearly 15 years now. And mm. the reason he's he's not been released after the 11 years was because he won't show remorse, a remorse for a crime that he obviously maintains he did not commit. Yeah. So essentially, the prosecution case was was fairly simple. Um, After the relationship ended between David and his ex-girlfriend, he plotted to get his revenge for her going out with somebody else. He faked a suicide attempt to make it look like he was too weak to carry out the attack, cycled 10 miles to her home, attacked her with an implement of some kind, a pole or a a claw hammer, Mm. before making his escape back home, again on bicycle. Phone records allegedly put him at the scene of the crime and a witness apparently described someone matching his description. So that that was really the same case. The defence case was quite simple. It wasn't him. He wasn't there. He didn't attack her. Um, He'd been home for hours. His alibi was that he turned his computer on to light the house when he got home at around 8.20pm. 
and there was no forensic evidence linking him to the crime. Um, so did he actually have a bicycle, Emma? Or, or... He did have a bicycle. Yeah, he did indeed. So so in terms of the bit, bit, just a bit of background to the case, so he was a 38-year-old builder who had been single for many years. He suffered from poor mental health and struggled to maintain some meaningful relationships. In 2008, he started working on a property and was told to, by his colleague, keep the lady next door sweet because she's always complaining about everything, you know, health and safety, building nice. regulations that type of thing yeah. so basically be nice to her so he was and they they got talking built up a friendship they um apparently they it turned out they frequented the same kind of nightclubs back in the day and um she's got facebook and there were some photos of him on there he hadn't got facebook himself so he went around yeah. and they built a friendship and a relationship started the relationship only lasted for a matter of four or five weeks uh, he realised that she really wasn't the, the type of person that he wanted to be with. And um, that kind of solidified for his, him when a, somebody else came on the scene, another guy came on the scene, and she's right. talking about having an open relationship, which was not to David's liking. So he basically said, you know, no, not for me. And he yeah. backed off. And he was quite pleased that this new guy moving in meant that he could take a smooth transition out and away. That's right. However, it seems that she wasn't prepared to let him go quite that easily. And he started hearing in the rumour mill that she was arranging for this new boyfriend to pay him a visit with his friends. So, oh. yeah, so this guy apparently was an unsavoury character. And David had, as I say, poor mental health. This really frightened him. And one night he basically took a massive overdose, took about 250 pills and oh, no and ended up in hospital um and after that he 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 came out of hospital about 10 days after he came out of hospital he um decides to go for a ride on his mountain bike about five o'clock in the afternoon yeah go to the local atm to co-op and then just had a bit of a ride around. And while he was on his phone, uh, on his bike, he was he was also on his mobile phone talking to his um, mental health nurse. Yeah. And he fell off he fell off his bike and he hurt his shoulder. Right. His phone then dies. He basically then goes home, gets home about twenty past eight, as I say, comes in, lies down on the sofa, uses his mouse to turn the light on on his computer, just give his yeah. room right. Lies down on the sofa to try and sort his pain out. At around 11, so he gets up at about 11.50, turns the light on, lets his dog out, turns the light back off, and then goes to bed. Yeah. About 3 o'clock in the morning, he hears a banging at his door. He has no idea who it is. He's terrified. He calls the police, mm. only to find it is the police. Oh. Is arrested and taken into custody. Yeah. Um, yeah, for um, um, basically attacking his ex-girlfriend. Now, he's not the only person on the list. There are a few people on the list. Uh, he sees the names when he's in custody, and he does see the name of the new boyfriend on there as well. So he's figuring, yes. you know, they're, they're rounding up people who know her ex-boyfriends. And so he obviously denies any involvement. Um, uh, and, and that's that. the real shocker about this case is that the victim, yeah. when she called 999 after the she attack, dialed 999, and she names the new boyfriend as the attacker. Right. Her son names the new boyfriend as the attacker. He then names the new boyfriend again when she's in the ambulance, and then again mm -hmm. when she gets to hospital. So... The new boyfriend, as I say, he's obviously, he's on the list as well, but he, he's disappeared now off to another county. And he Eventually, had a bit of a reputation. Before and he had a reputation for violence. He's got a history of violence. And I think her best friend had also said, I knew, I knew this would happen. I knew something like this would happen. So he feels very much like the prime suspect. You'd have thought he, so, wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. So he eventually he comes back and he's going to hand himself involuntarily to the police to be okay. in. On the way to the police station, he pays a visit to the hospital. 
And after that visit to the hospital, his name is not mentioned again. As the oh, other. man. She doesn't know who attacked her. She's, she's forgotten who it was who attacked her. So he goes to the police station and he's released. And David is rearrested. He's um, rearrested on the basis that his mobile phone was apparently in the area at the time of the attack. A wood chisel had his DNA and prints on it, and it was presented at trial. In the 999 call, the victim allegedly said, did I hurt his shoulder? Now, remember when I said earlier that David fell off his bike? Yeah, and hurt fell off his bike. Yeah, and that he lied about what he was wearing on the evening of the offence. Police said phone records put him at the scene shortly before the attack, and this was used to charge him. But this evidence actually never materialised. He was, in fact, five miles away, four hours earlier, heading in the wrong direction. And a witness statement apparently, apparently described him. So David is now in the frame. And um, a senior officer, when it was pointed out by a more junior officer, yeah, the suspect was uh, you know was the was the current boyfriend was told no no David is a far more likely candidate because of his mental health issues and that type of thing far more uh, likely candidate than the person she named as her attacker three times. So uh, the, David had no history of ever doing anything like this previously. No, no. no it, so he was he was a quiet person who. who happened to have mental health issues. And what's this about the wood chisel? Because he was a builder, wouldn't he have a wood chisel? Well, yeah, you know, the wood chisel thing was also interesting because forensics proved that he didn't have his DNA on it anyway. Oh. So none of the, this evidence ever materialised, but he was still convicted. The, the thing about the, um, the him lying about what he was wearing on the evening was interesting as well. Uh, because he had three pairs of um, cargo pants. Two were a name brand. They were the same sort. One was too yeah. small for him. One he wore. And then there was an unbranded pair that he didn't Man. wear. They, they had a rip in, the, in them, so you could only wear them over shorts. So he didn't wear them. Yeah. The police seized all three pairs of trousers, and he said which pair he was wearing that night, which was a yeah. this branded, pair, what, branded pair, the only pair that fit. And then... At some point later, they came back with one of the pairs of trousers and seemingly re-seized them. So it looked like he'd got four pairs, not three pairs. Wow. Sounds dodgy. Um, yeah. But ultimately what happened in court was that he was said to be lying because in the CCTV when he's seen earlier in the day on his bike, you can yeah. see the label clearly on the back of his trousers. Yeah. The brand. But these trousers, the, the label had been removed. And he's in court, oh. so I didn't remove that. Uh, the, you know, that that you can see the where it's been removed. Where it's been. Is where, and, um, of course, in court, they just say, well, you know, you can't possibly be accusing the police of doing that, can you, sort of thing. And he said oh, he, oh. he was made to look like a ripe plum. And the other thing, you know, he was, is the timing of getting to the crime scene and back, which was another thing that he couldn't have possibly have done. So he supposedly climbed over hedges and fences with his mountain bike over his shoulder to avoid CCTV, all just 10 days before being released from hospital, uh, 10 days after being released from hospital. He went out on his motorbike, uh, mo mountain bike on the evening of the attack. His phone records show the speed he was traveling at, and it took him almost 30 minutes to travel one mile and 90 minutes to do five and a half mile. They've got this from the mobile phone record. Okay. And uh, home was journey was downhill, so it took an hour. Now, the attack took place about 11.20 p.m., just before. Okay. So he was, remember, he was home by 8.20. The police drove past his house at 11.50 and saw a light come on, which David was, well, that's when he was letting his dog out. So if he were the attacker, it meant he would have had to cycle a distance of 10 and a half miles in 30 minutes, which is like 20 miles per hour, yeah. 10 days after a major overdose on a poorly maintained mountain bike, With going to be taking over fences and bushes and, and all sorts yeah. of things. 
So he couldn't have done it. But the, it, I I asked David, well, why would they pursue you instead of the new, the, the, the more obvious new boyfriend? Yeah. Um, and he, I mean, he doesn't know. But what he does know is that four years earlier, he'd given a lift to the boyfriend and three other people illegally as he wasn't insured to do so. And he was worried that he drove because he had to drive past a police station to get to the destination right. where he was going. So he was told by this new boyfriend not to worry because if they get stopped, he would sort it. And when the boyfriend's property was searched by the police, they discovered a handgun and a police issued bulletproof vest. Wow. As I say, apparently a high ranking officer had said not to pursue the new bloke as they had already got someone for it. Well, yeah, they had. They got David for it. So they just thought he was a more likely candidate. And the judge refused to allow any reference to the new guy and this bulletproof vest in his possession at trial. The, the, That's the other, just awful. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that the description that this witness apparently gave. Now, David's five foot six and overweight at this point. Okay. The description was actually turned out to say they were about five foot ten of muscular build. Now, that fits the new guy's description, not David. Yeah. Another important point was that she had been texting the new partner earlier in the day because she found out he's actually got a girlfriend so she was going to blow the lid on this relationship. Oh. The new partner said he was going to go round to her house to sort it out. Um, so, you know, all of that information, it all really mm. leads to the new boyfriend. I mean, so, it sounds very complex and a lot more involved than uh, an ex-boyfriend attacking an ex-girlfriend. There's a lot more to it than that initially meets the eye, isn't there? And you need to remember as well, they were only together for about four or five weeks. So this wasn't like a long-term relationship. Exactly. There was a, a casual relationship that he wasn't really that into and he was quite pleased to get out of it. So the prosecution just kind of, well, the police, the prosecution, they just found David and thought that he's the, the one we want. Yeah. Let's build a story around why it's David and why, why it should be him. Let's say... He was in hospital, the, you know, plotting his revenge on her was the story that they went with in court that this overdose of 250 tablets was just a pretend suicide attempt to make it look like he'd be too weak to carry out this. Oh, and the other thing was the um, it was proven that he, when he got back at 8.20, yeah. his mouse moved and he turned the light on, which is what he said he did. Yeah. But they, all very Columbo stuff, they said that he must have had some software installed on his computer that made it do that at that time and make it look like he'd moved his mouse at that time. And Software that, that can make you look like you've moved your mouse. Well, yeah, I mean, it all now. and this is going back to 2008, remember? So, I mean, for him, that's all witchcraft. He, he didn't know how to do that. He didn't even know how to set up an email address on his computer. Oh. That he... You know, he, he barely knew what to do with it. So to think that he could download all this software, like I say, all Columbo style and and make it look like he was home at um, 20, 20 past eight. When yeah. he, it, it, it was all quite ridiculous, really. But they just built this story around it being David because that's who they wanted it to be and the rest well, of it. I mean, this isn't a case I'm aware of or wasn't aware of before we had our conversation today. And yet... It's so obvious that the police have built a case to fit the person they want as a perpetrator, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, another thing that happened in court that was interesting was that the police had said they'd received a statement from his mother to say what a terrible, bad person David is. Okay. And David's mother literally just stood up because she was in, in the court. Yeah. And said, that's rubbish. I've never done it. I've never given a statement saying that. That's such a rubbish. That's a lie. But that was just, she was told to be quiet, of course, yeah. but um, that was just dismissed as to, well, the police wouldn't say they'd got a statement from her saying that if they hadn't. And she's obviously just there to protect her son and that type of thing. But, um, but of course, that's not been disclosed either. So this alleged statement. Well, we couldn't have guessed that, could we? No, exactly. Honestly, it's... 
And, you know, since this all happened, so, you know, ultimately David was found guilty. But what he found really interesting was that when the jury said guilty, the police wouldn't look at him. There was no celebration from them. There was no shaking hands. There was none of that. They all just no. got a out, wouldn't even look at him. And he found that really, really odd. Well, they know they've got the wrong man for this. They don't. know they've got the wrong guy. They know they've got the wrong guy. But um, it, the son as well retracted his statement saying it was the new bloke. He, he's, he's got, he he's basically said, oh, I just assumed it was. Which was, we which was don't all... know if if uh, the ex girlfriend and the son have been threatened by the new guy, do you? To well, exactly. Get a reputation for being a bully that could well have happened. We don't know. And so you know, somebody attacked her. Yeah, ultimately she was attacked, yeah. and uh, and he visited her in hospital before he went to the police station. And after the visit to the hospital, that's when it was no longer. His mm. name his name was no longer then um, included. But this is a case, I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear, where there's also been non-disclosure. Um, CPS have refused to disclose the statements made by the victim's son, naming the new boyfriend as the attacker, and only supplied the later one of him retracting it, stating he just assumed it was him. There's about eight or nine police pocketbooks he's asked for. CPS has supplied, but they've redacted everything. They've technically been supplied, but are completely useless. A CCTV at the T-junction near the scene has also been withheld. You know, it, it's it's a case of he's now got, got to a point where they've said, you're not saying why you want it, or you're on a fishing expedition, and um, we're, we're no longer going to communicate with you. Really? Well, it's just appalling. I mean, non-disclosure is... It's just such a feature of so many miscarriages of justice, isn't it, Emma? It's absolutely, yeah. it's appalling. Yeah, and in David's case as well, there's you know there's lots of issues in terms of the crime scene and how the crime scene was dealt with, and just sort of name a name a few. Um, their footwear marks at the scene didn't match anything he owned, and were a different size to his shoe size. The, replete, the police refused to tell him what size they actually were. The alleged weapon did not exist. The witness who claimed to have seen it admitted in court that they took two descriptions of different items from conversations he'd heard the police having and combined them to make up one thing. Injuries the police claimed existed were not as described as well. You know, her injuries were described by the police as much more severe than they turned out to be, i.e. they yeah. said lost an eye. She hadn't lost an eye at all. Um, you know, she'd had, uh, a, you know, a hand amputated. It was a finger. So they'd really overread all that information. Yeah. Um, the main weapon was claimed to have been yellow, but the later changed to red. Oh. <laughs> you know, um, despite several people entering the property, police, nobody saw this alleged weapon, which was then found all of a sudden in a location where people would have been tripping over it. Clothing was logged incorrectly. The chain of evidence was broken on the clothing. It was contaminated from other A&E admissions that night. The crime scene was compromised due to several people entering and leaving. A family member was given permission to clean up prior to forensics arriving. Evidence was recovered from the bin. Um, the police had, you know, did admit at trial that it had been a botched investigation. You know, there was DNA, partial uh, didn't match any of his partial print on the alleged weapon didn't match his print it, you know there, there's print, yeah, there's a print there, was, yeah, there was a print in blood on the door that can only have been either the victim or the attacker well it wasn't the victims and it wasn't david's it's an unknown you know it's an unknown person it, it just it leaves me a bit speechless to be honest because i wasn't aware of this case um but it's no. like it's like with all miscarriages, people fighting miscarriages of justice cases, you have to have new evidence to go to the CCRC. And if they're not providing them with the evidence, how on earth can you find the evidence? To no, and evidence? and that's it. And the you know the technical way of getting around supplying information details that is asked for is to redact everything, so it's basically useless. They so can't, they you know, they literally blacked everything out. 
Yeah, they'll do it on a subject as access request, in which case you get absolutely nothing whatsoever. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, mm. it, it's it's difficult for David now because he's got nowhere to go. And he, he has, like you said, he's on, he's on his own part in this, really, hasn't he? There's no team or... No, there's no one. There's no one for him, you know, fighting for him. So this is a very difficult situation for David Emma. So what is he hoping to do now? What is he hoping to be able to achieve or to get? Well, I asked David what what he was wanting to do, you know, what he wanted from this, and this is what he said. The next stage is unknown. Release appears to be as elusive as unicorns, pots of gold at Rainbow's End, and an honest offender supervisor. I am genuinely waiting to get old and exist no more. I have no future, only a past. If released on parole, I will never get another house, mortgage or loan. I'll be unlikely to own, ride a motorcycle again, or rebuild and restore cars as my hobby. Everything I do if released has to be approved, like a child seeking approval from parents to go to a party. And I will forever have to justify myself and answer endless questions whilst living in fear of being found out and run out of town by vigilantes moving from pillar to post to escape persecution. It matters little in many respects now if I am proven innocent, as the damage has already been done beyond repair. Even compensation cannot make up for the things I have lost. Friends, family, home, dog, possessions, respect, all the things I've seen during my time here. After 15 years, no decent woman is going to give me a second glance. Even if proved 100% innocent and given a million pounds compensation, I've still spent 15 years living in a prison where my bed, toilet and living space are all six feet away from each other. It's right up there with living in a shop doorway or being an ex-addict as far as society is concerned. As for here, I'm told to grow a pair, give it up, throw in the towel, take it like a man, and to just tell them what they want to hear so you can get out. Even following release on parole, many people still get recalled and lose everything again. I'll need to live like a monk or a hermit and change my name. After all, wife killers, in the eyes of many, are no better than nonces. If I am ever proven innocent of the offence, I would not be arrogant and celebrate. I will not have won anything after all these years, the miscarriage has still been carried out, someone was still seriously hurt, and the attacker has been able to get away with it all of these years. So no victory, just relief. And then follows the slideshow where everyone wants to know you, interview you, and turn your story into a film or mini-drama. They would probably use Johnny Vegas to play me. If you would like to do something to help David or send messages of support, please contact the Jeremy Bamba Innocence Campaign at www.jeremy-bamba.co.uk If you'd like to join our mailing list for the latest updates on the case as they happen, please email us via our website www.jeremy-bamba.co.uk